pastor here at St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. And that is especially my privilege today because the Jesus story that we're going to be sharing really is complementary to St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. And we'll see how that plays out here pretty soon. Today's story is the story where Jesus talks to the Jewish leaders of the temple about how they use their sacred space. Those are meant for a temple tantrum. Temple tantrum. Because of the way they're using their space. And so the question for us today as a community of, uh, of faith, the question for us is, how do we use our facilities, our sacred space? The question that we will pose for St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church today is, if Jesus were to walk into our facility and examine how we use the property and the facilities here, would he throw another temple tantrum? We'll see how that plays out. Be glad to do Scripture 
is a dream come true for someone who teaches the Bible in a one-hour Zoom or classroom experience. Not so much for delivering a 12-minute teaching on Sunday morning. For starters, and many of you already know this, today's story is one of the few that is presented in all four of our Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke place this story at the end of Jesus' ministry, immediately following his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on what we call Palm or Passion Sunday. This story sets the stage for the crucifixion in those Gospels. Matthew and Mark even have Jesus' words from this story misquoted and used against him in his trial, which would take place seven days later. But you might have noticed John's Gospel places this story in chapter 2, at the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry. John utilizes this story as a basis or even a rationale for the ongoing need of the work Jesus has started. If you're a student of John's Gospel, you're already aware that John does not make any attempt to order his Gospel according to the chronology of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John has often been called a mystical Gospel, drawing upon Jesus' story to present spiritual truths that transcend the sequence of events as presented by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But here we are, just a few weeks from the crucifixion drama of Holy Week and Easter, and we find ourselves examining a story from the viewpoint that is the onset of Jesus' time spent teaching and collecting followers. A dream come true for a Bible teacher teaching a one-hour class. Not so much for a minister trying to present a 12-minute message. This is where I should invite everyone to come back to our Wednesday evening Zoom Bible study at 6 p.m., but, but let's move on. In today's story, we're told that Jesus has traveled to Jerusalem for the Jewish celebration of Passover. Now, for Jews, Passover is an eight-day celebration commemorating the birth of the Jewish nation as Moses leads the people from slavery in Egypt to the freedom of being a nation and having a land to call their homeland. So the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and money changers seated at their tables. It was, and still is, common for Jews to take a holy pilgrimage to Jerusalem for Passover. The function of selling animals for sacrifice was a needed service for travelers who otherwise would not be able to present a sacrifice to God as required by the law of Moses. The money changers are also needed so the worshipers can pay the required temple tax. The law of Moses forbids this tax to be paid with any coins that bear a human image. Such coins were not even to be brought inside the temple, much less presented as a tithe or an offering or even the required temple tax. Roman and Greek coins, like American coins, bear the image of revered political leaders, which is an abomination for the Jews. Some of the Roman coins even proclaim Caesar to be the Son of God. Such a claim in Judaism is paganism at its vilest. Spend any time around Jewish synagogues today, and you will soon learn a primary difference between Jews and Christians is who is Jesus' daddy. 
Jews will not concede of a God who fathers a child with a human. For Jews, this is pagan. It was what Gentiles would believe. After all, in Jesus' day, Caesar, the emperor, was called the son of God. But Roman coins, like American coins, were necessary to live in Roman-controlled lands. Rome had taken political control of the Jewish homeland by military force, and Roman money was the forced monetary system. So money changers were necessary if the people were to pay their temple tax. So why is Jesus so upset? Not one of our gospel stories even hints that the vendors are in any way cheating the people, overcharging, or selling inferior animals. So what has set Jesus off on a rampage of turning over money booths and using a handmade whip to drive the animals out of the temple? John points to Psalm 69 in which the psalmist says, It is zeal for your house that has consumed me. Traditionally, the sellers of animals suitable for sacrifice and the money changers who took the Roman coins in exchange for Jewish coinage had been located within eyesight of the temple grounds in the nearby Kindron Valley. But first century Jewish records indicate that the high priest Caiaphas, who will play a major role in the crucifixion scenario, has moved the merchants from the Kindron Valley to the court of the Gentiles, which is in and part of the temple complex. You see, under the law of Moses, no Gentile was permitted beyond this space called the court of the Gentiles. Only circumcised males and women firmly attached to circumcised males were permitted past the court of the Gentiles. By Jesus' time, a great prejudice has grown between Jews and Gentiles. But the great Jewish prophet Isaiah had presented God as telling Israel that God was giving the Jews to the world. God giving the Jewish people and the Jewish nation to all of the world that God had created as a light to the Gentiles, Isaiah said. Israel was to be a light to the Gentiles. But Gentiles were limited to a small outer court in the temple and not permitted in the actual worship space for Jews. Here is a good opportunity for Bible discussion. How can Israel be the light to Gentiles if Gentiles are not even permitted in the Jewish worship space? Good topic for Bible study, not so much a 12-minute teaching. But this is the stage, if you will, for Jesus' actions. In Judaism, in Jesus' day, Gentiles were marginalized. They were feared and considered outsiders. And now, they're not welcome even in the court of the Gentiles. Moving the merchants from the Kindron Valley to the court of the Gentiles makes perfect logistical sense. You have a large room that is by design set aside for Gentiles, but because of the prejudice, you don't allow Gentiles to use that space. Your own people need the service of the merchants to worship God. Why make them walk a mile down the road when you have all of this unused space? The high priest, Caiaphas, made a popular decision when he moved the vendors to an unused room in the temple complex. The people loved the new convenience. 
But Jesus' understanding of God did not allow him to appreciate such catering to God's people at the expense of those not loved, not welcomed, and not accepted. And John's Gospel uses this story to speed Jesus along his way and step with the outcast community in all its variety. Jesus will be welcoming to every variety of outcast, even those not permitted to take part in temple worship according to the law of Moses. Jesus will also train his followers to do the same and in the end commission his followers to go into all of the world <clears throat> with this message of open, welcoming hospitality. This third Sunday of Lent might be a good time for us to think about our usage of sacred space. I think we do pretty well. We make room for Boy and Girl Scouts, Narcotics Anonymous, soccer teams, homeless folks, nursery school, children and youth activities, AARP tax consultants, and worship space for weddings and funerals. We create bags of food to go home with school children who might not have adequate food over the weekend. We have a food pantry and give office time and financial resources for helping people in financial crisis. All of this, in addition to Bible studies, mission projects, United Methodist Women's Missions, and a host of other services for people in our community and around the world. Would Jesus throw a temple tantrum at St. Bethlehem? I'm glad to say I don't think he would. But we must always keep the question in mind. I'm proud of the work of the leadership team and a host of volunteers at St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. Oh, and by the way, our community gives back to us. It isn't just a one-way street. But just last week, one of our scout units gave over 300 pounds of food for our Anne's Closet Food Pantry that supplies much needed food for, few, for food insecure families in our area. Narcotics Anonymous gives financial uh, uh, offerings on a regular basis to our community of faith, even though we don't charge for our community usage of our space. So, God is using St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church to help supply needs to our community. But God is also using our community to help supply the needs of St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. In the wilderness, you gave Moses your commandments that those who were wandering might become your people. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we, pra we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. You restored Gentile worship in the temple and foretold of, uh, of Jesus' resurre resurrection from the dead. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. 
he gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. To remember him thus is uh, foolishness to the wisdom of our age, but your foolishness is greater than our wisdom, and your weakness is greater than our strength. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is God. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, with confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
some faith communities who own church facilities are more concerned with maintenance of those facilities than they are with sharing Jesus. I've got to tell you, I love being the pastor of a community of faith that is more concerned with serving our area's population than we are about making sure nothing gets scratched or broken. I have a friend whose wife works for the IRS. Now, she is politically active in trying to remove tax-exempt status from churches. She believes that most churches are, her words, sanctified social clubs, and that they're open and welcoming only to people they like or people like them. But even she recognizes the difference at St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. Our faith community is a witness to her, and being a witness is part of our baptismal covenant. A question being asked by folks like her and American culture in general is whether nonprofits or tax exempt organizations such as the church should be required to provide a public service to maintain their, their tax exempt status. Let me know what you think about.